Welcome to Higher Ed Without Borders and our special four-part series on Small College America. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Dean Hoke, and with me is my co-host, Tom Davison. During this series, we're going to talk with four small college presidents across the United States about their institutions, what makes them unique and important to their communities. Also, we will discuss their challenges and their views for the future. Dean, would you please introduce our guest today? Well, I'll be delighted. Tom joining us today is Dr. Stephanie Niles, president of Cotty College in Nevada, Missouri, with an enrollment of about 350 students. She is a national leader in her field and has been a successful strategic and innovative leader at multiple outstanding liberal arts institutions. Dr. Niles comes to Cotty from Ohio Wesleyan University in Delaware, Ohio, where she served as vice president of enrollment and communications. In 2018-19, Dr. Niles served as president of the National Association for College Admissions Counseling. And in 2017, Dr. Niles was the recipient of the Fulbright International Education Administrators Award and participated in cross-cultural exchanges, examining higher education systems in France and in Belgium. Dr. Niles holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia, a master's degree in education from Indiana University, go Hoosiers, and a doctor of education in higher education management from the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Dr. Niles. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Yes. Thank you. Tom? Yeah, Dr. Niles, let's start off speaking about Cotty College. Can you give uh, our audience a brief history of the origins of your institution, your students, and your programs? Absolutely. Glad to do so. I'm actually sitting in what was the original building on the original campus of Cotty. When Cotty first started, it actually educated students from kindergarten up through the second year of college. Our founder, Virginia Alice Cotty, who became Virginia Alice Cotty Stockard, eventually marrying a teacher whose children were enrolled at the school. In 1884, she had a vision for educating women and saw the need to educate women here in Southwest Missouri. And so she looked at that point in time to Mount Holyoke as her guide for thinking about women, particularly in higher education, but at the start was committed to educating uh, young individuals throughout that educational spectrum. And so we have always been an institution that um, has been committed to diversity um, in terms of geography, in terms of race, in terms of country of origin. As the institution evolved and eventually became a two-year institution for women, um, we also became known as an institution welcoming of international students. And for a long time in our history had welcomed international students from around the world. Typically we enrolled 12 to 15% of our student population from countries other than the US. It's a little depressed right now due to COVID, but we're certainly looking to see that rebound. Um, but that's been a part of, of who we are, being welcoming and open to uh, women from around the world who want the experience of being educated here. As I mentioned, we were a two-year institution for much of our history, but uh, about a dozen years ago, we started offering four-year bachelor's degree programs. And so now we offer 15 degrees that are uh, four-year experiences. And so now the majority of our students who are here, who come here to Cotty, are seeking that four-year educational experience. Let me follow up with that a little bit before I go into my next question. Are, you talked about the international students that you have, and even though I know that's a little bit depressed as it is for everybody, are most of the students from Missouri itself or where are they from? Where do they come Interestingly, from? Interestingly, only about 28% of our students are from Missouri. So it is the state most represented on campus. But when you look at peers and other institutions, uh, other private institutions, they tend to see a much higher percentage of students from, from in-state. And so we actually see a, a nice wide representation, certainly here in the, the Midwest and the southern part of the Midwest, we see a good bulk of our students, <clears throat> but we typically have in the range of 42 to 45 states represented on campus. And oh. some of that is, is because of our relationship with PEO International, which I'm sure we'll talk about here in just a moment. Well, matter of fact, I think that's what we'd like to talk about right now. As I understand the history um, and what you've talked about here, uh, the founder, uh, Virginia Alice Cotty, in around 1927, uh, bequeathed the college to an organization 
titled the PEO Sisterhood. Now, I know a little bit about the PEO, but it's, what I understand about it is that it's you are the only non-sectarian college owned and supported by women. Yeah. Tell us a little bit of what the PEO is. I don't think most of our listeners, frankly, in the United States or certainly internationally know a great deal about it. And explain this unique relationship. Absolutely. So PEO was initially founded in about the 1870s on the campus of Iowa Wesleyan College, where there were seven women who came together, actually two of them not selected into their sorority of choice. And so these seven friends came together and said, we'll form an organization ourselves. Um, that organization, which started on campus, eventually grew to other campuses and eventually grew beyond college campuses and became an organization of women and in support of the education of women. It was in the early 1900s that PEO took on its first, uh, actually at that point in time, it was a loan program, their first um project, if you will, was an educational loan program for women looking for a, a low interest loan that would allow them to pursue or finish their educational experience. Over the next essentially 100 years, PEO took on several more projects, scholarships that then served women at different stages in their educational journeys. And in, as you said, Dean, in 1927, Virginia Alice Cotty was toward the end of her life at that point and was thinking about this institution into which she had invested so much of herself uh, and had become her profession and her career and her love and wanted to ensure its financial sustainability into the future. She had later in her life become a PEO, uh, a member of the sisterhood, and she felt so strongly that PEO's mission was so well aligned with her own for her institution that she gifted Cotty to the PEO sisterhood. So now for 95 years, we have been, at, um, as, as you said, the only institution that is specifically for women and is owned by women. So it is a really special relationship that we have. It is one where we have benefited tremendously from that those relationships Certainly there is a financial benefit there in the ways in which PEO's um, dues come to CADI to help support both the ways in which we maintain our buildings and our general operating fund. Many of our most generous donors are PEOs who love this affiliation that they have with this college, but we also see a tremendous recruitment benefit. You know, we, as I mentioned before, 28% of our students are from Missouri. They're more familiar with us being in our home state but it's because of that PEO relationship that we are as diverse as we are, that we do attract women from indeed all over the country and all over the world. And PEOs are out there talking about Cotty to their, their friends, their children, their grandchildren, their colleagues. <clears throat> they're, they're going into schools for us. They're representing the institution in various ways, talking with young women about this experience. Um, so we benefit tremendously. They also support our students here on campus. There are, um, they give gifts to students uh, in various suites. So all of our students on campus live in suites. Each suite is endowed by uh, a PEO state, district, or regional organization. Um, and so they feel a tie to those young women who live in those suites. And so they'll send gifts to them um, and, and we'll connect with them and support them at various times throughout the year. Our students will also go out and now, of course, as we're doing so much more virtually, it's become easier to do this, but they'll go out and virtually speak at PEO meetings to talk about what they're learning at CADI, what their CADI experience is like. So we're able to, to share back with PEOs who've given us so much well, how students are benefiting from this institution and, and specifically the shared relationship. It's quite remarkable. Tom? Uh, Dr. Niles, that is a unique situation there at CADI. And um, to continue on that, that um, route with uniqueness, I understand there are probably less than 500 schools uh, in the United States, or less than 100 private schools in the United States, I'm sorry, with less than 500 students. And I'm certain that that number is much less when you consider it's an all women's institution. Now, some people argue that small colleges are not sustainable and should close. What is your opinion on that? And is the reason why schools like Cadi are important to society? 
You know, Tom, I've only been here since July 1st. And in the less than six months that I have been here, I have spent most of my time really trying to connect with this community, trying to listen, to learn. I've met with between two thirds and three quarters of all of our students, all of our faculty members in various meetings, our staff, members of the Nevada community in which we're located, members of our board of trustees and our alumni board to really try and understand this community and its, its uniqueness and how distinctive it is. And one of the things that I have heard over and over and over again, I've, I've said to colleagues, if I were to create a word cloud that would highlight those words that stood out most in these conversations, community would be the word in big, bold letters splashed across the center because this is such a distinctive and special community. Now, is the Cadi community for every student, every young woman who seeks the college experience? It's not. It is um, very much, it's a supportive um, but challenging community. You know, we, our mission is to educate women in a diverse community in a challenging curriculum. We seek to prepare women to be leaders, to understand their social responsibility, and to be globally aware. And so we're looking for those students who want those tenants to be uh, most critical to their educational experience. But this community, its size that it is, really does mean that you can't fall through the cracks here. And I've had students say, you know, it's just not possible to fall through the cracks. There's always somebody who knows you, who's there to support you. And, and of course, that's a, that's a real positive. I was just talking actually today with my vice president for student life, and we're talking about registration for next term, who isn't, and we can very easily identify those small number of individuals who haven't yet completed that step. And there are handfuls of people who can reach out to them because of the relationships built, the connections made, and, and the real tightness of this community. Um, so I think that for that reason, for, for lots of different reasons, there are students who seek this type of experience. You know, I would say we see students from all sorts of high schools, from educational backgrounds, from socioeconomic statuses, but we will see oftentimes strong students from smaller, more rurally or remotely located schools, perhaps more so than from the, the inner cities or the larger cities. So we're looking for those students who've maybe had their own smaller experience. Um, and who are looking for that place to thrive, to find their voice, to, to come into their own, knowing they're going to be challenged yet supported in this environment. And they're looking for that, that real chance to thrive. And over and over again, the stories, the outcomes prove that that is what Cadi does for students. So it absolutely has that distinctive place for the, the young woman who um, sees the, the need for that kind of community as a way for them to launch themselves into their own personal and professional lives most successfully. You know, as a follow-up to that, Dean and I both attended small colleges uh, in our undergraduate areas, and we we both recognize the sense of, oh, I'm not saying ownership probably isn't the right word, but when a, a community like Nevada, they, they do feel ownership to that institution that's in their community. And um, having spent eight years in Kansas City uh, and working and living, I'm not that familiar with Nevada or Cotty, but I am familiar with that part of the state. And it's a beautiful area down there. You're not far from Branson. You're not far from Lake of the Ozarks. And it does have a, a draw to it that I think a lot of people, if they investigated and heard about Cotty, would find very fascinating and maybe be very interested in attending that. So I think you're uh, right. I think geographically, those who know it are for the very same reasons that you've indicated, right? That there's, um, I'm, as I said, only been here since July 1st. So there's so much more that I am looking forward to learning about this part of, of Missouri, but you've hit on some of the highlights. And I hear that from individuals from, from out of the immediate area. Um, if they have been familiar with this part of the state, it's it's because of those you know lovely locations, those um, opportunities that they have. Everyone I know who has spent time in Kansas City thinks it is just the best place to live. They they love it. My time has been mostly at the airport so far <laughs> in my travels, but I look forward to getting know, to know Kansas City better. And I know our students take advantage of it. Our faculty members will um, utilize where we're located geographically to take advantage of getting students out into the field, whether it's a history lesson, an economics lesson, uh, uh, something related to the environment, but they will take advantage of that. 
I had some students over to the to the president's house just after our fall break, and I was talking to them about what they did during that long weekend. And most of them stayed here, but they went to Branson, they went to Kansas City, they went over to St. Louis. So they took advantage of right. just time on their own to explore where they're located. And, and these were students from California and Texas and Florida who couldn't travel to their homes, but really took the opportunity to get to know where they're located now. So personally and academically, those opportunities exist for them. Well, you'll love Kansas City, I can assure you. <laughs> I look forward to getting to know it better. <laughs> yeah. Dean, I think you have another question. I do. Um, our audience is a combination of the United States, but we also, since we started the series, um, have developed quite an international audience. And I think they'd be surprised. Number one, I think you already talked a little bit about it, that you do have international students coming to a place that I assure you that most people don't know in Europe or in other places, but they found you and they've come there. And that's interesting. Mm -hmm. But what I found more interesting is what you're doing in student in study abroad. And again, you seem to be doing some things that I don't necessarily see other colleges and universities doing that, as I understand it, fairly early in the college career, meaning sophomore type year, you have students go abroad at least for a week. You kind of do a, a organized thing. Can you talk a little bit about that and what was the logic behind that and how does that work? What's the mechanics? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to. So since about the year 2000, we have taken students during our spring break. We have a two week spring break. So for the first week of that, when students reach their sophomore year, they're eligible to go on the spring break uh, trip. And it's multifaceted in that they, um, we, we work with the tour company. And so there are a few days as part of that trip where we are uh, taken on tours of historical sites within the particular cities that are chosen. We also though take faculty and staff with us and those individuals deliver, deliver what we call modular experiences. So usually a half day experience for students and they have choices um, to take them somewhere different than what we've done as part of the very organized part of the tour. And they sign up in advance for that. But we also make sure to give them at least a day, if not two days of free time in that city. And we purposefully tend to choose cities with good public transportation systems, safe public transportation systems, because we want them to get out and explore on their own. We want it to be part of their own experience, growing as an individual, to be in a foreign country and to navigate with, with peers, with others around them. They're not on their own. But we want them to navigate um, another part of the world and to make some choices on their own as to what they do with their time and how they can um, enhance the cultural experience that they're having through their own choices. It is something that we we fully fund for our students. They pay very minimal cost for insurance and uh, of one or two couple of meals throughout the course of the week. But otherwise, um, we fully cover their expenses on that trip. Um, they they actually, for the last couple of years, our incoming first year students during the first week, they have had the chance to vote on a couple of locations. And then, of course, they're then become eligible and get excited for that the next year. The students then who've selected the location for their sophomore year have about a week's time period once they know what the location would be in their junior year, selected, of course, by the, the first year students, have the chance to defer for a year if they would like to do that. So there's a lot of opportunities for students. So for example, this year we're going to Vienna, Austria. Uh, next year we're going to Dublin, Ireland. And the students who started this, this fall made that choice to do that. And so we had a handful of students who were going to Austria who've now decided to go to Dublin, but we'll be taking about 75 students um, to to Vienna um, this this coming March. And so I'm really excited for them. It's, it's you know, initially it was because we were a two-year institution, it was a pinnacle experience, right? It was the end of their time here at Cotty. But as we have evolved into a four-year institution, it's really become an opportunity for students to wet their whistle, to early on be acquainted with this idea of traveling abroad. We have a pretty high Pell eligible, low income and first generation population here at Cotty. So some of these students come here not having been on a plane, not having a passport. And so this is a first for a lot of them in a lot of different ways. So we really, um, 
look for this to perhaps be part of that developing a sense of global awareness. Maybe it encourages a student to, to study abroad themselves, to spend longer, a longer time period outside of the country on a summer or semester long program. Uh, perhaps it, it encourages a student to take a language or to take a different set of courses because of um, knowledge or insight that they've gained on that trip. So it's a really, really a, a transformational educational experience for many of our students. You know, I just put together, I just published an article just a few days ago about study abroad and mm -hmm. particularly uh, lamenting that we have so few Americans that go abroad. The numbers are, in my opinion, appalling. Um, wow. And they're really like what IIE is trying to do some things to get students to go abroad, particularly um, underserved population. I'd like you to briefly explain, if you would, why this helps them from a career point of view. Once these students attend, they've had a chance to do this. Why is that? Besides that, it's a really neat trip. Sure, sure. I mean, we all live in a global interconnected world, right? There's so few, I think, professional opportunities these days where you are not being connected to other parts of the world in which we live. And so the understanding and appreciation of different cultures, of, of languages, of that interconnectedness and how the world functions, how what happens in other parts of the world impacts us here in the U.S. and what happens here in the U.S., you know, impacts us around the world, right? And we see that, right, in current events. What's happening in in with Russia and Ukraine is impacting uh, uh, some of the supply chain issues because of how other countries are affected by that. Uh, you can point to so many events like that. And so for our students to start to understand and appreciate that, they certainly do so here on campus, in the classrooms, in their studies, but then to take them to another part of the world to, to in that, and, and it is only a week, and, and there are certainly some limitations there. But again, it gets them to start thinking because it's an educational trip. Um, we, we make sure that they enjoy themselves, but they are being educated. They are being asked to think, to journal, to reflect on their experiences, in, and they are uh, prepared in advance by a class that asks them, mm -hmm. uh, it helps them to really start thinking about what, what to think about, what to consider, what questions to be asking when they're abroad. And so I think that that only better serves to start preparing them to be thinking critically about how professionally eventually they may be working in that interconnected environment. Tom? Yeah, and to, just to follow up a bit on that too, I think in Dean's article, he touched on that too, about the fact that employers are really looking for students coming out of school that have this experience or ability to either speak in foreign languages or have comfort levels and dealing with people from other countries because it is a global society. And right. uh, so I think in addition to the fun aspect of it, uh, just getting their feet wet, initiating this concept of getting a passport, knowing how to, to deal with the airports and the, the airlines and those type of things takes a lot of stress uh, off the, the individual and better prepares them for going into the, the world of work. So Absolutely. I think it's a great aspect that, that Kavi has and does, and I, I applaud them for, for what you've done in this area. I think if, you know, if two students were equal, right, in all ways, GPA and other experiences, and one had studied abroad and one had not, you know, I can't imagine in so many professional settings that that wouldn't be the student who would have a bit of a leg up, right, in coming into the workforce, because they can talk differently about what they've experienced in another culture and how they've interacted with people whose backgrounds and experiences are, are different than their own, unlike the student. And, you know, not every student has that opportunity. And there are other ways to be um, globally minded. But that study abroad opportunity for those who can take advantage of that is, is a huge benefit. Right. Thank you. Dr. Niles, I think we're heading towards our, our last question. And as I always call this a, a question, but it's actually a bit of three parts, but, and it's more about you. Um, I heard your background. It's, it's very impressive. Uh, I think they're lucky to have you, but Thank you. the three parts are this. Number one, what attracted you to higher education in the first place? Second, mentors. Who helped you along the way 
and how did they help you? I think this is a common issue that I, I like to ask a lot of college administrators. And third, what have you learned about being a leader of an organization such as Cotty? And sure. you can say it in five minutes or less, you're doing very well. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. So my, of course, my background is in enrollment and marketing. And for the first 25 years of my career, I spent time in five small liberal arts colleges working in, in that capacity. And, and, you know, when I, so I think about what drew me to that. I actually transferred twice as an undergraduate. I started as a musical theater major, um, attended a, a school um, in a large urban area. I then went to a very small school religiously affiliated in my hometown to sort of re regroup and figure out what was next when I changed my major. And then I decided to be an English major and went on to the University of Virginia, where I had a tremendous experience and, and a real love for that particular course of study that I that I chose, but I also had gone through the admission process then three times at, in three very different ways. And so I became really curious about how one was competitive in one place versus another. Why were these processes so different? How were the schools as different as they were? And how did that impact the processes? As I then did an internship in the admission office at UVA, I also started to learn a lot more about marketing, outreach, promotion, influencers. And of course, these were back in um, certainly pre-email days, really almost very early web days. So the tools were very different at that point in time. And so I would say really this whole idea of the psychology of choice, how students make decisions, how they choose institutions, what's important to them in that process, and who are the people what are the, the tools, the outlets, the messages that are influencing students and, and how are they being impacted by the various ways in which they reach out? So I really first got into it trying to understand this, this psychology of, of choice and was really intrigued at each of the institutions at which I worked to differently understand the populations attracted to that institution, why that was, and how I, as the, the chief enrollment officer, had to structure the organization to be in support of both attracting students I knew would be attracted to the institution, and how could I grow and expand that in, in new and different ways. So I have had the chance to work for um, a couple of highly selective institutions, uh, a religiously affiliated institution, another woman's college before I came here. So each of those populations was very different. They were located in the Mid-Atlantic, the South and the Midwest. So there were some nuanced differences there. So I, I really loved the time that I spent enrollment, but as I became a, a senior leader, I started to think about the ways in which my division impacted and was impacted by the work of the rest of the institution. And I really enjoyed being in president's council or cabinet or senior leadership team meetings, depending on what they were called at inst each institution, as I worked with colleagues to um, make sure we were doing all that we could to ensure the institution would thrive. And I really then became more and more attracted to the idea of the role of the presidency, to have that ability to fully impact the, the campus community, to be formulating the environment for our students in which they could best thrive, to, to consider how to be innovative and creative and collaborative within these environments as we look to the future, which of course has been ever, ever changing and, and expanding. Um, so as I moved through my career, yes, there were absolutely mentors that were uh, of of note, and and two of them in particular. One is Nancy Gray, who is the president emerita of Hollins University, uh, and the other is Rock Jones, who is the soon to be retired but not yet retired president of Ohio Wesleyan University. And both of them uh, really supported me in the work that I did for each of them and with each of them. They were individuals who. Um, both new enrollment to a certain extent, and they asked good and detailed questions, but they also allowed me as an individual, and I saw this of my colleagues as well, they allowed their leadership team to thrive. They allowed them to do the job they were hired to do. They supported them, mentored them, um, ensured they were headed in the right direction, but gave them the bandwidth and empowered them, me, to, to, to do the work that I was um, that I was hired to do. And so as I think about my own leadership style and how they have influenced me, that's one thing I hope for is to empower the people around me, encourage 
encourage them to solve their own problems, be there in support of their needs when they can't, uh, and but to help them to thrive and to grow and to um, be the best that they can be for the institution. And when it's time for them to move on, um, for them to be um, well positioned to be successful elsewhere. I have, you know, feel that in my career, one of my greatest successes have been the people that I have been able to network with, the ones I've stayed connected to, the many individuals I've hired and who've gone on to be senior leaders, um, to take on different roles within, particularly in enrollment counseling, but have, have gone on to impact higher education in the ways that they felt um, they could be most effective. And I hope I helped them to realize that because of the ways that my mentors did for me. The last thing I'll say along those lines is, um, particularly Nancy Gray, um, she, I remember an uh, early interaction with her where I said to her, you know, you say thank you all the time. I said, I'm always copied on emails where you're thanking somebody for what they did. And I said, you know, sometimes I feel like this is their job, right? They're, they're doing their job. And she said, you know, people, if they feel valued, appreciated, respected, they will be even more effective. Um, the, the positive reinforcement is will never hurt, will always help them to want to give and do and be more. And that, that, I still remember that moment. And I've really tried to internalize that also as a leader to try and recognize the people around me to foster their strengths um, and to show that level of appreciation for the good work that they do. Tom, I think we need to wrap this up. So if you could take us out. I will. And again, we would like to thank our very special guest, Dr. Stephanie Niles, the president of Covey College. And I would just add to her comments. I think that having a career in higher education myself, I think one of the special aspects of that was both working with and mentoring students and colleagues and helping them and watching them grow and seeing that enthusiasm for and it's a great profession and a great career and uh, I, I would just uh, like to add that to Dr. Niles's comments that I, I totally concur with that. Well this concludes the special episode of Higher Education Without Borders, Small College America. If you would like to comment on today's show and suggest a future guest, please go to www.highereducationwithoutborders.com comment section. On behalf of our guests, Dr. Niles, Dean Hoke, Edu Alliance, and myself, thank you, and make sure to subscribe via your favorite podcast app. This has been a production of Edu Alliance, an international higher education consulting firm with offices in Abu Dhabi and Bloomington, Indiana. Nathan and Hoke, along with their team of experienced professionals, have assisted universities worldwide. To learn more about Edu Alliance, go to our website, www.eduAllianceGroup.com. You will find details on our podcast, contact information, and our services. Thank you.